Hi everybody and welcome to part three of my Winter West Highland Way wild camping adventure. Well before we get into the video proper I'd just like to explain that I'm filming a few short little linking clips such as this one to move the story along in certain places. This is due to heavy intermittent showers on the day ruining a lot of the footage by uh, covering the lens in raindrops and making everything a bit blurry so I really didn't get the amount of footage that I really would like to have made a decent video. I hope that you'll still be uh, happy with what I have produced and this will be the weakest video in the series. And uh, So without further ado let's jump right into the, uh, the video proper and uh, you can find out why I begin the day hiding out in one of the toilets at Salocky Bay. Morning folks and welcome to day three. Now on Salocky campsite I'm currently sheltering in one of their composter toilets waiting for it to get light enough. It's about ten past eight at the moment still almost fully dark. It's raining, uh, started raining fairly heavy about an hour ago, uh, but luckily I'd got up at five, had some breakfast, got everything packed. Uh, it was raining then, but not too heavy, so I managed to get everything packed away, uh, relatively dry, barring the tent. The plan today is to reach Doom by a Bothy. I'm hoping it's open when I get there, so uh, I'm gonna sleep in the Bothy tonight if it is. I'm not sure how much footage I'm gonna get today because of the weather, and also because I'll be negotiating the tricky section north of Inversnade so uh, I'll do, do what I can, do my best and uh, hopefully I'll come up with something worth watching for you. Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to get a bit lighter then I'm going to be on the move so I'll speak to you in a bit. Hi folks welcome back well I've made a start I've uh, just come up the really big climb out of Salocky well I say really big it's not really long but it's long enough for first thing in the morning just to uh, tie you out especially with a big backpack on. Uh, it's quite a climb uh, it's any time of the year, but uh, yeah, moving on now. I think I'm just skirting Ross Point and I should soon be, be at Rower Denon. I think the cloud cover must be rolling in ahead of me fairly well because I could see Ben Lomond a moment ago, but it's disappeared now into the cloud, so must mean the heavier rain's coming. So. Okay, so I'm just passing the Mill of Ross, and that's two kilometres to go to Rower Denon. I think there's a water top up point somewhere close to Rower Denon, so I'll try and get that and get my water bottle topped up. Okay, so we're just passing the Rowan and Hotel and the uh, the famous Klansman Bar, all closed at the minute. Uh, but I've just filled up my water bottle. There is a tap here, just at the front. There's also a post box, and uh, just in case you should need to be posting any postcards. Shortly past the Rower Denon Hotel is one of the iconic points of the West Highland Way, this being the war memorial on the side of the lock in the car park at Rower Denon. First thing I did when I got there was fish out the memorial wreath of poppies from the undergrowth that had obviously blown there a couple of nights previously with those strong winds. After taking a few photos I rejoined the West Highland Way and had a short conversation with a few of the park rangers that were stood about there near the station. They asked me where I was bound for, I said doom by a bothy and I asked them if it was open. They said they thought it was and they gave me the advice that if I did decide to stay in there make sure I put my food in the metal box on the bench otherwise the mice and the pine martins might come and take it away for me. Having never seen a pine martin before the chance and possibility of maybe seeing one was very appealing to me but like the red squirrel they eluded me once again. Hi folks I've reached the spot on the West Island Way where it splits. You can take a 
the bottom route by the lock or the alternative top route which runs high up and gives you good views of the lock. Uh, I've always done the top route before when I've travelled this way usually for speed and I really ought to do it this time but I've never been the bottom route so I'm going to go that way and give it a look we'll see how we get on. So just in there there's a nice little flat spot where I've camped on my last two runs through the West Highland Way. Uh, previous time uh, was earlier this year with Sean. Uh, we then in the morning packed up, headed back up hill and took the top route. So today I'm going to take a look at the bottom route. There's a fair few other little spots as you come down the track here. And just, just over there there's quite a good water source. It's uh, flowing quite uh, heavily today. So we'll press on and see what we see. All new to me this. So there's been quite a bit of up and down over some rocky and precarious ledges and now I've reached some steps down and they look like they head down across the bridge down there. Nice little wild camping spot roughly halfway along the bottom track. Up till now there's not really been anywhere suitable, it's been quite rocky and quite close to the edge of the water. But yeah, I bet it's popular in summer, but if you can get here in time before anyone else, great spot. Yeah. Behind me is the memorial to Bill Lobben, who died on the 23rd of November 1975. He made the supreme sacrifice in saving the life of a friend. So having passed by the Bill Lobben Memorial now a few times when I've walked the West Island Way, I was keen upon my return to look into the story and see what I could find out. Now Mr Lobben, who was 41 at the time and a father of two, was among a party of ten walkers who were walking along the path side at Loch Lomond near Cale Ness Burn. Now in 1975, which was five years before the West Island Way came into being, I would imagine that there wasn't half the good quality bridges that are there now that cross over the burns and gorges and gaps that mark that part of the trail. When the party reached the Caelness Burn they found it to be in full spate, a raging torrent and so murky they couldn't see the bottom. From past experience it was thought that the depth here where they attempted to cross would be only about two feet deep, so three of the party, two teachers and a 17 year old student named Jackie Melville, roped up and attempted to make the crossing together. Suddenly one of the group plunged into a hole and the force of the current was so strong it took all three of the walkers off their feet and swept them down the burn and out into the lock. Witnessing this event take place and seeing his friend Jackie Melville out in the lock in trouble, Mr Lobbin cast off his own backpack, dived into the water and began to swim out towards Miss Melville to offer assistance. Unfortunately before he could reach her it was Mr Lobbin himself that ran into difficulties. This was probably down to strong water currents and cold temperatures, after all it was mid-November. It was Miss Melville who then attempted to keep Mr Lobbin's head above water by hanging on to his shirt collar. Unfortunately he was taken from her grip by the strong currents and he slipped below the water. So the next time you pass by the Bill Lobbin Memorial, be sure to spare a thought for him on that dark, fateful November day. I'm back on the main path of the West Highland Way now. I got to Road Coach Bothy, but uh, it looked like someone was in there. There was smoke coming out of the chimney, so I didn't go in. If I'm honest, I'm quite uh, concerned about reaching Dumbai Bothy in daylight, so I'm, I'm trying to press on as fast as I can so the footage is going to be a bit as I've said earlier it's going to be a bit intermittent so uh, hopefully I can uh, have a better talk to you when we get to Dumbaya. arrived at uh, Inversnaid by the Inversnaid Hotel, close for the season. Uh, the water taps are off as well, so I'm going to have to uh, scrounge a bit of water out of the stream with my filter. Now, I've just come down from the bridge over the falls and down the steps. And when I got down the steps, there in front of me was this bag. In what was to be the first of three acts of kindness today, my good friend Andy Swan, with whom I'd had a pint with the night before setting out on the way from Mulgai, had made an 80 mile round trip to leave this morale boosting goodie bag for me at Inversnaid. 
This greatly appreciated care package contained a bag of my favourite Haribo sweets, a Christmas card and a small bottle of Macallan single malt whisky. So that was a really nice treat to find. Thank you so much Andy. So I'm going to get a quick drink now, quick drink of water out of my, out of my bottle and uh, I'm going to press on and see how far we can get. I've done ten and a half miles so far, it's, it's about one o'clock. Um, so we're going to be losing the light in a couple of hours so we can't have about too long. I'd like to have meant something to eat but I'm just going to have to go for it. So I'll leave it there and uh, catch up with you in a bit. I still had about six miles to go to the Bothy at this point and that was over the toughest terrain on the West Island Way. Over this section of the way you can realistically take your normal walking speed and half it as you clamber over rocks and tree roots. I can honestly say that with my heavy pack and the wet greasy surface this has to have been one of the hardest days walking I have ever had in over 40 years. So it was shortly after passing the Inversnaid Hotel that the second act of kindness occurred that day. I was alongside Loch Lomond on a tricky section of rocks when my phone rang with an unknown number. Now normally I wouldn't answer a, an unknown number but on this occasion I was glad of the rest and quite curious to see who it was that was ringing. When I answered the call it was uh, Nikki from the Blackwater Hostel at Kinloch Leven. She explained to me that she was going to have to cancel my booking due to Covid and people cancelling and it just wasn't worth her keeping the hostel open. And she said would you like um, any help trying to find some alternative uh, accommodation in the village and I said well if you could help me out that would be great. I said but could you get back to me in five minutes with a text rather than ring me as I'm on the side of Loch Lomond and I'm sort of needing my hands at times to scramble and I might not be able to answer the phone. Uh, to this she replied are you doing the West Highland Way and I said I am and she says oh just give me five minutes and I'll get back to you. So sure enough about five minutes later uh, I received a text and I stopped to uh, read it and it was Nikki again from Blackwater and uh, she replied that um, there was no problem, my booking stood, uh, if I was doing the West Highland Way that was great and she'll come down Saturday personally, unlock the hostel for me and everything was fine. So if you're watching this Nikki, thank you very much for going out of your way to accommodate me and uh, we'll see more of the Blackwater Hostel later in the video series. Ooh. Well, I've just traversed some of the uh, the more tricky obstacle sections. Uh, still a few to go, like, but don't know how to take it out of here, especially with the pack on. Slippery as well. Just brought home to me like a fall now, and could be quite uh, it's quite serious. Anyway, I'll press on a bit further and uh, just let you have a look round where I am. Still high above the lock and uh, still chasing the daylight. I'd heard about the wild goats that lived among the forested shores of Loch Lomond but I'd never seen them on my previous two hikes along the way. But take my word for it, you'll smell them before you see them. So I've uh, arrived at what I call the pinch. This clip from my 2019 footage shows just how tight this gap is, but it is doable with a sensibly sized rucksack. So I'm going to have to uh, get the Bergen off and just uh, carry it through there sideways, there's no way I'm going through with this one on. As I closed in on Doom by a Bothy I was exhausted and found myself repeating the words nearly there out loud to keep me going. It was almost dark as the Bothy came into sight and suddenly I recognised the sound of a generator running before someone hailed me from the roofless cottage asking if I was okay. I replied that I was about on my chin strap and couldn't have walked much further and this was where the day's third act of kindness came along when the friendly chap asked if I needed any food or water. I said I was okay but just wanted to get settled down for the night in the Bothy. He said I was the first walker they had seen in four days and went on to tell me he and his girlfriend had walked away a few years ago and fell in love with the cottage and decided to buy it to renovate. He and his friend then come down for a few days at a time to work on the renovation and during this time they live in a shed inside the cottage itself. He then invited me to join them later to watch a film on Netflix which seemed a little surreal out here in the middle of nowhere but I politely declined and entered the bothy and started to get stuff hung up to dry. I'd only been in the bothy about an hour when the door opened and in walked two other walkers who told me they had parked at Bainglass and walked in with the specific intention of spending the night in the bothy. They quickly proceeded to get a fire going, into which they placed some sweet potatoes. It was then out with a chopping board, onto which garlic and sausages began to be chopped. 
Forcing down my third dehydrated meal in as many nights, the thought occurred to me that I'm doing this all wrong. Thank you.